All right. Happy weekend, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. My name is Nathan. Uh, I run a startup called Founder Suite. Most of you are probably familiar with that already. Um, but we make a platform of software tools for raising money. We make a CRM for managing your funnel, a database of investors, and investor update tool. Uh, but before founding Founder Suite, I spent about 12 years working with startups as fractional CFO, helping them raise money. And about half the time we were successful, about half the time we failed. So this talk is basically everything I learned from 12 plus years of fundraising. First off is how not to do it. Um, Hunter is a, a venture capitalist in San Francisco. And I just love this quote. Will you intro, intro me to investors? Too broad to be acted upon. But this is how a lot of founders approach fundraising. They just start asking everyone they know if they can connect them to investors. Um, and this, but this has a couple problems with it. For one, it's too unfocused, too ambiguous. And for two, it's putting the hard work of figuring out who you should be talking to, your target list, on the shoulders of, of the other person, where really that's your job as CEO. Um, when people used to hire me as a consultant, I would put in 50 or 100 hours doing that research building, target list building. And it, we also want to kind of unpack this into two, two tasks, right? One is building the target list and the other is finding our intro path. So instead of doing it unfocused like this, we like to uh, kind of pull a page from the sales playbook, right? If you've ever been in sales, especially B2B sales, it follows a pretty straightforward approach. You build a list of leads, you qualify those leads, you engage with them, and ultimately you try and drive them all towards a close. And we can apply this to fundraising just as well. Right? We like to think about fundraising in terms of the funnel. Top of the funnel, you're building that large target list of potential investors. Then we actually screen, filter, qualify that list. And then everyone that's remaining in that list, especially if it's a venture fund, we need to figure out the right person to target, right? You don't just pitch uh, Benchmark or Excel. You need to find the right partner, decision maker there. Then it's, this is the one step, number four here, is where it kind of differs from sales in that fundraising is all about the introductions. So we want to try and map our best introduction path or build an introduction path if we don't have one. We're going to talk about that more. Those introductions, of course, lead to pitch meetings. In those pitch meetings, you're presenting your business plan, uh, your, your docs, all that good stuff. If you're doing well in your pitch meetings, that gets into due diligence. You're getting term sheets. If you get through due diligence, um, if you're not familiar with due diligence, it's basically a very deep dive into your business. Uh, when we raised money, I got the term sheet from an investor on Friday. I was all excited. On Monday, they sent me their due diligence list. It was like 150 items they needed. Um, everything from articles of incorporation to uh, personal references to access to our Google Analytics to customer references, all that stuff. But assuming you get through due diligence, you're selling shares of your company. So fundraising is just another sales process. We can break it into its step-by-step -step components. And when we do it like this, I find it takes away a lot of the, the pain and chaos and frustration that a lot of founders have with this process. So, um, you know, so again, the funnel is our metaphor for fundraising and breaking it into step-by-step -step components is what we're going to do on this talk. Step number one is building that top of the funnel. So especially if you're at the pre-seed or seed round or angel round, um, I always tell founders, you need at least 100 names on your target list. And oftentimes that's more like 200 or even sometimes 300 names. Um, if you're at the series A, that number goes down a bit. Maybe it's more like 30 to 50. Series B, probably even a narrower list. But you know, really fundraising is a numbers game. When we were raising our seed round, I pitched over 200 investors and ended up with one venture firm and 10 angels. And you can do that math. That's about a 5% conversion rate. And that also means I was getting rejected 95% of the time. That's actually pretty normal. Um, but sometimes that's a shock for founders that are you know, used to being successful in other parts of their lives. Now they're just getting rejected 95% of the time. But that further emphasizes why you need a really healthy top of the funnel. So some ways to build that top of the funnel. 
<clears throat> AngelList is a good place to start. There's roughly 30,000, 35,000 investors on there. You can search by uh, industry, location, school, right? Who are all the angels that went to the university you went to? Company, that's kind of interesting. So pretty pretty useful ways to search AngelList. Um, and uh, and you can you know play around, filter, and see who's getting funded. There's no way to um, get the contact information from AngelList though, and the and the database definitely skews towards angels, not so much VCs or others. But it's a good place to begin. Within Founder Suite, we're building out a database pretty aggressively. We've got about 21,000 venture funds and about 100,000. Angels, family offices, fund of funds, PE firms, hedge funds, foundations, pensions. We're aiming for a very broad database, but we're, our data is fairly basic. We basically took all these investors and tagged them by market tag and location tag, collected their description, and then their links to their social profiles. So we're kind of putting that second layer of research on, on the other person right, to do that level of digging. And so how most people use this is they'll do a couple searches by maybe your market or your industry or your location, um, kind of browse through these. If someone looks good, open up their LinkedIn page, their AngelList page, um, do a little more research. And if they look good, you add them to your board by clicking add to research. Uh, and oh, by the way, actually one little update, we're about to add contact information for roughly 30,000 more investors in addition to what's in there already. So that's pretty cool. Crunchbase is another good place to work on your funnel. The way I like to use Crunchbase is I make a list of 10 or 12 companies that are similar to mine, but not directly competitive. And I plug each one, one by one into Crunchbase, and I see who funded them at the relevant stage I'm at. Um, oh, we have a question. All right, let me see if this works. When will you add, oh, Edward, yes. When will you add the 30,000 contact details? In the next couple of weeks. I don't have an exact timeline. We're working on it right now. We're cleaning up the data as we speak. Thank you. Um, so Crunchbase, plug each similar company into Crunchbase and, oops, sorry and then see who funded them at the relevant stage you're at. Um, another way to use Crunchbase is if you have an investor, you can plug them in there and see who they co-invest with. That's pretty useful too. You can also do general searches on Crunchbase, which I find their search a little bit confusing, but uh, you can as well. Lots of other places to build your funnel. So these first three things, PE Hub, Inside Venture, Venture Pulse, these are daily newsletters you can subscribe to. And basically when a startup raises capital, they announce it in here. Um, so you can see who's getting funded, who's funding them. Also when a new venture fund is launched or when a venture fund raises a new fund, they typically announce it in these places. And that's a great signal because the best venture fund to be pitching is one that just raised some new capital and ready to do, do new deals. Um, conferences can be kind of interesting, especially if you're in like a new or emerging market like blockchain or cannabis or drones or, you know, whatever is interesting, uh, trend of the day, um, artificial intelligence, a lot of like conferences sprout up almost overnight. Investors love to build their own brand by getting out there on the speaking circuit. Quora, TechCrunch Medium, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. Quora is kind of interesting though to poke around on. People have spent time answering questions like who are the top 10 e-commerce angels, right? Um, PitchBook and CB Insights are kind of the gold standard of investor databases. Um, PitchBook, we have a subscription to, so I know it pretty familiar or pretty intimately. <clears throat> Very deep data. You can get like who are the attorneys on a deal. Oftentimes you can get valuation um, and who is lead investor, stuff like that. So pretty deep data. Uh, the problem with these are they're very expensive. Uh, PitchBook, I think, starts at about $15,000 a year for a single user. CB Insights, I don't know exactly their pricing, but I think it's like $50,000 on up. So, you know, if you have a friend that can help you with that, good way to approach it because they're pretty amazing databases. 
and then mining your personal network. So I'm going to show you two ways to, as I call it, scrape your own personal network to help build your target investor list. Okay, so first is to go to LinkedIn and you can just do a generic search like angel investor. So this is showing 208,000 results for angel investors. So that's really too broad to do anything with. So what we want, I think that's probably LinkedIn's entire, you know, network. What we want to do next then is apply a couple of filters. So I might do a search on first degree connections just as a reminder of who I'm connected to. But for this scenario, I'm going to do second degree. And then since I'm in Tampa, I'm going to try a search on Tampa, Florida, see what I get. Okay, not a huge list, but 86 results. So this is showing me 86 people that have the word angel investor in their title that are in the Tampa, St. Pete area that I have at least one mutual connection to. And so what I would do next is go command click or right click and open them up in a new tab. I might open, you know, 50 or 100 at a given time. And then I go through and just spend 30 seconds or a minute kind of skimming everyone's profile. And if someone looks good, like they do actually invest in my type of deal, you know, Ger Gerald probably does real estate deals, so probably not a good fit. But anyone who looks like they might be a good fit for my type of deal, my type of business, I would add them to my target list. And I would also make a note of who my best mutual connection is because that's the person I'm going to ask for the introduction later. So that's one way to kind of scrape or mine your own personal network. Another way I'll show you, um, this is my founder suite board, kind of messy at the moment, but the thing I wanna point out is this column here called Steve B. Leads. So Steve Bennett is a real person. He's a professor of entrepreneurship at San Jose State, and uh, he's just one of my advisors and a really good guy. He knows lots and lots of people. So what I did is I came over here, added a new column, made him a column, called it Steve B Leads. Then over in settings, I invited him in to be a, a member of my account. And I asked him to add some people from his Rolodex, from his network to my investor target list. And he added 10 or 15 names to this. And I repeated this process with five or six other advisors and ended up generating like 50 or 60 good solid um, intro paths by having a structured way of asking my advisors to open up their network. So we're still on step number one of building this target list. And this is pretty heavy duty lifting, um, but it's important stuff. We want to have like this optimal list of people who do your type of deal. Um, and once we really kind of dig into this and start looking in all these databases and different sources, you just start to see investors all over the place. There are a lot of investors out there. Okay, we talked about that. Once we've built that list of say 200 names, we actually, our step number two is to start removing people from this list. We call this qualifying the list. And going back to our, you know, fundraising as a sales metaphor, you know, the best salespeople don't just chase every prospect. They spend a lot of time qualifying their, their leads, prioritizing, rating and ranking their leads so that they focus their time on the best prospects. And we want to do that same thing with fundraising, even more important. Um, even more important with fundraising because, you know, fundraising, you've probably heard, it's like a marriage, right? You're going to be in bed with these investors for the next five to eight years of your life. It's almost, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult to get investors off your cap table once they're on there. So you want to be really careful and choosy in who you pick. And also, you know, if you're pitching and pursuing a really good focused target list, it just makes your fundraising a lot easier, right? You're talking to qualified buyers. So anyone who's invested in a competitor, you want to remove them right away. Um, if they're ethical, they won't even talk to you. If they're unethical, uh, you know, they'll send your pitch materials to the competitor. Um, if you're going after venture funds and that fund has not raised a new fund, oh, excuse me. Sorry. If that fund, if that fund has not raised a new fund in the last two or three years, 
they're probably only doing follow-on deals in their existing portfolio companies, right? There's kind of a life cycle with venture funds. They raise a new fund, they do 20 or 30 deals, and then they save half of the fund to do follow-on deals, to bet, to double down on their winners. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, should absolutely not pitch them or talk to them, but it's easy to waste a lot of time pursuing and talking to these funds that aren't really actively doing new deals. Um, same with angel investors, right? If you plug an angel investor into AngelList and all their deals are from 2015, you know, good chance they're taking a break at the moment. Wrong sector, wrong stage, wrong geographic location should be pretty intuitive, right? If you're a medical devices startup, you would not be pitching a, a fintech company and vice versa. Um, geographic location, you know, some venture funds are very specific. They have a charter, like they invest in Pacific Northwest startups that might be part of their charter because of where their money, their LP money comes from. But others are very agnostic about it. Usually just figure this out by looking at their website. And then lastly, bad reputation. Again, as I mentioned, you know, you're in bed with these investors for the next five to eight years of your life. So you want to pick ones that are going to be good partners. This is really important. Um, and conversely, you want to avoid ones that are going to be bad partners. Founders do get fired by their investors and you see some pretty, you know, aggressive stuff happen sometimes with investors. Um, so how do you figure bad reputation? There are a couple ways. If you're in an accelerator, you know, talking to your peers is a good way to do it. Once you actually start getting into like term sheet discussions, doing some good quality reference checks on, um, uh, on the investors with their portfolio company founders. And then there are a couple sites out there. One is called thefunded.com. Another is called Rate My Investor, I believe it's called. And these are kind of like Yelp for VCs. People have left reviews, rankings, and things like that. Pretty interesting to read some of these, actually. They're kind of like, you, you fall down the rabbit hole, you'll you know, start reading all these, you know, inside scoop from founders. My only caveat is um, take it all with a grain of salt because a lot of those bad reviews are left by founders that maybe were rejected, right, from the, the investors. So um, there's probably a little bit of a bias to it. In general, um, what we want to be doing is removing roughly 25 to 30 percent of that initial list. And so what remains is a really highly focused qualified list of prospects to pursue. And again, this will make your fundraising go faster if you do this work. Um, so much of fundraising is about getting momentum going for your deal. And it's very hard to get momentum going on a deal if you're pursuing the wrong leads, right? Uh, okay. So now step number three, now that we've got this nice qualified list of relevant investors, we wanna figure out our best uh, intro path into each investor. So basically this is a LinkedIn job, maybe Facebook can, can serve a role too, but in general, you'll plug every investor into LinkedIn, or if you're using Foundersuite, click on the LinkedIn icon, which will open up their page. And you wanna see if you have any mutual connections to that investor. If you do have more than one mutual connection, good job, you're obviously been you know networking. Um, if you have more than one mutual connection, there's a hierarchy of who to ask for the introduction. First and best is someone that's made Tim money in the past. Maybe uh, uh, another investor or an angel. Tim will take that introduction all day long. Um, when I was raising money, my son is in preschool and I got to know some of the other dads and one of the dad uh, had just sold his company for $600 million to Yahoo. And he made five or six introductions for me to some investors and every single investor he introduced me to what got back to me within 20 seconds. It was amazing to watch, you know, the, the level of responsiveness. Of course, I don't have too many of those types. Number two on the list is someone that Tim has uh, co-invested with. This could be an angel that feeds him deals or a VC that he's done deals with. Number three on the list, and this is where you should pay attention, is as someone that Tim has invested in. This could be a, a portfolio company founder that Tim's you know, put money into in the last, say, six or 12 months. 
we'll come back to that. Number four in the list is uh, what I call the professional connectors. These are the biz dev guys and gals who work at the big law firms and accounting firms, and they know everyone in the startup ecosystem, but they make a lot of introductions. So sometimes the, um, the signal is not so strong. I just noticed something. Look at Tim's list here. It says Theranos. I wonder if he's removed Theranos from his, uh, his list. This is a little bit older screenshot. Um, number fifth, where are we at? Fifth on the list is someone that um, Tim met at a conference a couple years ago that connected on LinkedIn, but they don't really know each other. So if you have zero connections, what do you do? Kind of one of the most common questions I get. The hack here is to research and find, you know, three or four portfolio company founders that Tim is invested in and then cold email them in a, just a real friendly way. Like, Hey, I see Tim put some money into your startup. I'd love to hear how it's been working with him. Is he involved? Is he active? And you get a dialogue, you get a rapport going with these founders. It's okay to ask for the introduction to Tim if they like what you're doing. And the reason this hack is very effective is because Tim went through due diligence on that founder, got to know that founder, built up a level of trust with that founder. He did that before he wrote him a check or him or her a check, right? And that founder was in your shoes six months ago when they were fundraising and probably doing the exact same thing that you're doing. And so there's a level of empathy there. And also just founders are pretty good about helping other founders. So that's your hack or workaround to getting the introduction if you don't have one. If you're not willing to take the time to do that, should you just send Tim a cold email? Um, you know, I, I've seen cold emails lead to meetings. I've never really seen them lead to a deal. Um, it's easy to find people's email addresses, right? Like there are tons of tools for that. Um, we have some of that in Founder Suite. But the problem with the cold email is that Tim is already getting 50 warm introductions a day from people he knows and trusts. And so, you know, if he even reads your cold email, there's already a little bit of a, a stigma to it that you didn't, you know, come through a trusted referral source. Other investors, you know, investors get more deal flow coming at them than they can even like really process. And so other investors actually kind of screen or filter as a first pass based on how you reach them. So, you know, getting the warm introduction is always much more effective than the cold email. However, I have sent cold emails in the past. You know, I'm guilty of it. If you're going to do it, just make sure it's very personalized, tailored to the investor, and, you know, really states a clear reason why you're reaching out to them. Okay, step number four is getting organized. So, um, you know, you've got 200 names on this list. Uh, you're about to start fundraising and reaching out to them. Every time you have an interaction with an investor, it almost always leads to two to three follow-up actions. And so you need some way of keeping on track of all this. Um, another key reason why you need an organized, you know, an organizational tool like a CRM is because you want to be running a really efficient, fast fundraise, right? You want to be getting momentum going for it. And the way to be doing that is to be making sure everything is happening quickly, nothing's falling through the cracks, that things are moving in a really quick and straightforward way. I used to build these spreadsheets for startups that works pretty well for the first like week or so, then they get you know convoluted and messy and aren't really actionable. So of course, here's our product placement. We ended up building this CRM for fundraising, which is what you see in Founder Suite. Um, and I'm just gonna show a couple quick tips here um you know the really the the metaphor again is the funnel so you've got your kind of sideways funnel i guess you could say of your research your contacted pitch diligence committed or said no and really kind of your job as this the ceo is to be moving all these cards the bad joke i make you move it's like a game you're moving all these cards across the board from left to right if you move them all into the committed column, you win the game. If you move them all into the no column, you lose the game. Um, but practically speaking, like I'll block off, you know, an afternoon, four hours in the afternoon and just come in and work on my contacted list, right? I've been introduced to Brad Feld. What can I do to nudge that along into setting up a pitch meeting? 
And likewise, right? I've pitched Tim. What can I do to nudge that along into terms discussion or diligence, right? Is he waiting on customer references? Is he looking to set up a second meeting? Are we scheduling with his assistant? Like, what can I do to kind of nudge everything along so you're moving these cards, you know, through the stages of your funnel? Um, all very drag and drop, all very intuitive. And of course, you can see all your act activities and metrics on one page. Like, what's the master to-do list of what you have to do? Um, I'll just show you a few other little tips on how to use some of this stuff because I know a lot of people are, are using this. Um, I already showed you can customize the columns to match your own workflow. I added a column over here called connectors. This is just where I'm like collecting my connectors, so to speak. I also added a custom column called qualified and mapped. This is where I move people after I've made sure they actually invest in my type of deal my stage, sector, all that good stuff. And maps means I've figured out some mutual connection to ask for the introduction. A um, couple other just quick things that are useful for many folks. I believe that every investor should have an owner, right? If you're raising money with your co-founders or you have advisors or consultants involved, make sure every investor prospect has an owner. That's the person who's ultimately responsible for driving that lead you know, to a yes or a no. So that's that. Um, and then of course, all your notes, activities, right? If you've got, you know, meet them for coffee, um, export that out to your calendar of choice. Uh, if you need to assign it to your co-founder, you can do that. So you can add notes, activities, tasks, files. What's the term sheet you sent Michael Walsh? What's the pitch deck you sent Michael? Add that here so it becomes kind of a part of the record. And then maybe the coolest part is uh, connecting your email so that all your email threads with that investor get automatically pulled in. And if you're doing this as a team, you can toggle it on so that everyone can see each other's email. So everyone kind of knows, you know, we call it high visibility fundraising. Everyone can see what everyone else is doing with the investors. Um, that's pretty much it you know, kind of the key point is to get organized, right? Um, again, you want to be getting momentum going. You want to be running a streamlined, efficient process. Um, as a bit of a side, I've been interviewing founders for this podcast and I ask them, you know, did they run a process? What was the process like? And almost to a T, everyone who raised money in under four months or less was really efficient in, in how they ran it. So that's where the CRM comes in. Okay, before we actually get out there and really start fundraising, I just like to take a moment, pause, and make sure your pitch materials are awesome. Um, one of the most common mistakes I see founders make is they go out with like a crappy pitch and you don't get to go back a month later and try you know, for a redo, right? That's not how it works. Um, so just make sure you've given your pitch at least five or 10 times to to people who will give you like honest, brutal feedback. This could be other founders. It could be investors you're friendly with. If you know some, you know, investors it could be your attorney, anyone who's like qualified to give you honest feedback, you should be pitching. I just did a podcast earlier this morning with a guy um, in New York and he had actually practiced his pitch or given his pitch as practice 25 times before he actually went out there talking to investors, right? That's maybe at the extreme, but at least five or 10 times is kind of a good benchmark. Um, in addition to your pitch, you should have a good financial model. If you're raising a million dollars, you know, show me how you're gonna spend a million dollars. Um, also, if you can show what your business model looks like at scale, that's pretty compelling. Um, and then of course, if you have like a, if you can put together a one pager or executive summary, tear sheet, that's pretty useful too. All right, so now we're actually ready to, to open the curtains and start our fundraising in earnest. When you're doing the research on how you're connected to different investors, you'll probably find that a lot of roads lead through a couple power connectors. In my case, Jeff Thomas, he's a guy that works at NASDAQ, and he knows lots and lots of investors. And so I found that a lot of people on my target list were connected to Jeff. So I put this email 
to Jeff saying, hey, Jeff, I'm raising money. Do you know any of these people well enough to make an intro? And are you willing to make an intro? And he can just respond to this saying, hey, I know, I know Tom, I know Jessica, I know Kyle, I don't know the other people. He can very efficiently kind of process this list, just say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, to the people I've identified that he's connected to. Contrast this to that very first slide I showed you of how not to do it. If I went to Jeff and say, hey, Jeff, do you know, do you know anyone I should talk to? He would have to think about his entire network of people, and he's got 800 or so uh, investors in his network, and he'd have to like mentally process that whole list, whereas this is very reactive. So for everyone, he says that he's willing to make an introduction. I put together a clean email that looks like this. Notice how short and, and simple this is. Only three lines or three sections. Another mistake I see founders make is in that first intro email, they'll include you know four dense paragraphs and a 20 slide deck and all this other stuff. That's way too much for that intro. The intro email is just kind of like a teaser email to, you know, hopefully lead to a call or meeting. So a couple of key points on this. One is it's very short. Number two, the subject line, super important. Jeff, can you introduce me to target name? And then what are we doing? Raising a seed round. And then at this point, we had a lead investor already committed. So I put that in here. That's pretty exciting. That will definitely catch the attention of this guy, Clint. If I didn't have a lead investor, of course I didn't start off with that, I would put in whatever single metric or data point is the most exciting, sexy part of our business. Put that in the subject line. Subject line, very important. Again, these guys are getting 50 intros like this a day, so you wanna make sure they actually look at your email. And then just kind of a few other points here. Good chatting with you, I'm raising a seed round. This is what we do, we make this investor management reporting platform. Here's a link to our website if you want to check it out. I've seen 30% of these type of emails don't have any link to the website, right? And they're making the investor kind of like Google it. That's kind of a fail. Then the ask, ask for the intro. And then kind of the reason why he's got a good track record in our space. And then uh, I noticed this guy went to the same college my dad went to, very small one in Iowa. So I put that in here to personalize it. And then I include a link to our deck. And I'm doing a couple things with this. One is I'm showing off our own platform, right? Dog fooding it. Um, I'm also using this as a way to qualify Clint. I want Clint to click on this, look at our deck, and if we're not a good fit for his type of investment thesis, I want him to opt out up front rather than setting up a meeting, driving down, you know, an hour and a half each way to meet with him. I'd rather him like opt out up front. So I use this uh, link as another way to qualify the investor. And this is not our full deck. This is a teaser deck. I don't remember exactly what I have, but it was like four or five slides. It was like problem, solution, market opportunity, team, and traction or something like that, right? Just kind of a teaser deck. So he kind of gets a feel for who we are, what we're doing. And I'm also, of course, tracking if he viewed it or not, because that's part of the function of Founder Suite. And so I can see if this guy's actually paying attention if he looked at our deck. And then all Jeff, remember Jeff is our connector, all Jeff has to do is click forward, hey Clint, can I connect you to my friend Nathan, send. Hey Jessica, can I send, connect you to my friend Nathan, send. Jeff can fire off you know, five to 10 intros in 10 minutes or less. I'm making it easy for my connectors to do their job, super important. So it's, it's game on time, right? Our connectors are making these introductions. Uh, hopefully they're leading to pitch meetings. And, you know, just a couple key points about these meetings, right? Um, I use Richard. If you guys haven't watched HBO Silicon Valley season one, go back and watch it. Uh, if you have watched it, go back and rewatch it. It's just so classic and so accurate in so many ways. But I like to point this out, like Richard is the CEO of Pied Piper. He's an engineer, he's an introvert, he just wants to be writing compression algorithms, but he's gotta get out there and hustle and meet all these investors. And these investors are you know, really smart, they all went to Stanford and Harvard, uh, very successful, that's what made them uh, investors. And a lot of big egos with these guys and gals, 
And, you know, investing is what they do professionally all day long, every day of their life. Whereas for Richard, this is his first time doing it. So the only real way to kind of overcome that disparity is to channel your inner hustler. Whether it comes natural to you or not, if you want to raise money, you have to channel your inner hustler and kind of treat it like a game because it's very stressful. If you treat it like a game, like Bachman or like Bachman does, you know, maybe not to that extreme, but um, it, it can actually be kind of fun. So we're in full on hustle mode. So a couple hustle tips here. One is doing the intros in parallel or basically all around the same time frame. We call this the blitzkrieg approach. And what we're trying to do here is get momentum going for your deal. Funding deals are driven by momentum. And the joke I make is as when you walk in the, the door of the VC's office, there's a meter above the door and it can smell if you have momentum, it can smell if you have desperation. So you want to be walking in, you know, smelling like momentum, giving off momentum. And, and in every meeting, investors will ask you, how's the round coming together? That's their way of probing. Does this deal have momentum or can I just watch and wait, right? Because their natural inclination is to just watch and wait. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you want to be able to answer that question with, hey, we just started our round. I've got 10 meetings this week. I've got 12 next week. I'm pretty excited about some of these. Um, we're running a pretty efficient process using Founder Suite, of course. And I'm really hoping to, uh, you know, we're planning on, on wrapping this up by Christmas. Um, and that's a signal that this thing is in play, right? If, they, if they're even partly interested that they need to kind of march to your timeline uh, because others are interested as well. Um, and of course, as you start to get term sheets and, and things like that, you convey that to other people uh, that are interested. So it kind of builds, momentum builds on itself. And eventually, you know, you really have all the leverage and control and, and you can dictate when the deal closes, terms, timeline, all that good stuff. So your job, key point, if you, if you remember nothing else from this talk, your job as a CEO is to get momentum going for your deal. Um, and you kind of know it when you feel it, right? You can kind of feel when the deal has momentum. Now, you never want to lie about your, your momentum. You never want to say you have a term sheet. If you don't, that will bite you. It's a small world. Investors talk to each other. Um, but you, it is good to signal when others are interested, whether that's in terms of meetings, term sheets, whatever it may be. As you're getting momentum, you want to be kind of constantly improving your pitch deck. When we were fundraising, by the time I was done, I was on version number 42 of our deck. And I would go out, I would have two pitch meetings, come back home and, you know, put my kids to bed, crack open a beer and spend an hour revising my pitch deck based on questions I got during the meetings during the day. And by the end, you know, it was a really strong story. And so what's happening here is you're getting momentum going for your deal. Your pitch is getting better and better. And these things reinforce each other. Uh, you know, you want to be kind of, we're kind of already talked on this, but like leveraging VCs off each other, uh, not in a malicious way, but basically signaling when you have interest from others, they really kind of respond to that. A lot of fundraising is driven by uh, greed and fear. Fear of missing out is a very powerful motivator in fundraising. Um, and then lastly, you should be sending, this is a hack that uh, not many founders do, but if you do it, it will set you apart from 95% of the other founders out there. And the hack is to be sending a regular one page or less update or newsletter to every investor in your funnel that you've talked to that has not told you no. So again, everyone who has not explicitly told you no should be getting a one page update from you. Um, and, and the reason this works is because for one, you're showing that even though you're fundraising, you're making progress and momentum in the business. And number two, you're showing that you're a good communicator. Every investor has put money into a deal and then never heard from that founder again until it's almost out of money. And they hate that. So you're showing that even before they write you a check, you're a good communicator. You're showing that you can act like a CEO, right? Because that's part of the CEO's job. Um, so everyone who's not told you no should be getting a, a short Shorter is better, one page updater, or one page update. The other kind of hack here is even in advance of fundraising. If you're planning to raise money in March of 2019, 
and you've got a target list of investors now, it's actually pretty cool to reach out to them and say, hey, I'm not raising money right now. We're not going to raise money until Q2 of 2019, but you are squarely on our target list. You're right in our sweet spot. Can I have your permission to add you to my, my uh, distribution list of my updates? They're very short. I won't bother you about it. And you start to build a distribution list of investors, even in advance of fundraising. By that time, you're actually out there raising. They've got to know your story. They know your business. And it can really kind of warm things up and nurture those leads in advance of fundraising. And so my last little product bit here, I'll show you very quickly, is we have a tool for this that's been very popular. You know, why don't more founders do this? Because it does take a little bit of time. So we've kind of approached this, like what is the minimal viable update that you should send? And we've kind of helps, we basically got it down to about six different sections, give you some prompts of what to write for each section. Um, you can pull in a KPI table. This is your key metrics. Uh, pick which ones you want to, to show. And then add an image. If you've got a cool product, add a screenshot of it or a picture of it. If you don't, or even if you do, add an image of your team. Um, this is another kind of little hack. Like add a picture of your team and every update that's going out, especially to these prospective investors. And so by the time you're raising money, they, they've seen your face, you know, six times and they kind of know who you are. They're familiar with you. It's really powerful. And then you publish this and I'll just show you what this looks like. Just a moment. So you publish this and then what this looks like is something like this. This is what the investors would see. It would be your logo, not mine. Be your picture, not mine. Little navigation bar on the side. Um, you know, we we launched a homepage, so we put that in there. Have our metrics and KPIs, and then I, another thing that I kind of like doing with these is having like highlights of the last month or last period, whatever period it is. Like, what are all the cool things that happened in your last quarter? And then concluding it with looking ahead, right? What are all the things that are upcoming in the next quarter? And then when you send the next update, you know, you talk about all, all the things you accomplished and you're kind of creating this loop. Here's what we're going to do. And then the next update, here's what we did. And investors see this progress and it's really powerful. Um, the coolest thing about this then lastly is that you can track and see which investors looked at your update and how much time they spent. And this is a key buying signal, right? If you send out an update or a newsletter to 100 investors in your funnel, 50 of them looked at it, 20 of them spent, you know, two or three minutes on it. Those are your buyers. Those are people who are clearly following along with your story that are pretty interested. Uh, okay, last but not least, you can use this tool to uh, put your pitch deck up online. We did that. And same thing, I can track and see who's looking at it. I showed you with my example there. All right, that's my last product placement. Thank you for listening. Um, last but not least, treating this whole thing like a full-time job, the more you can treat it like a full-time job, the more momentum you can get. And just know it's gonna be very, very stressful. I actually thought I was getting an ulcer uh, during this waking up in cold sweat during the due diligence process. That's just how it goes. A couple more hacks here. We're almost at the end. Um, we did some retargeting ads. Uh, one of my angel investors who wrote a $70,000 check said that every time he logged into Facebook, he saw a founder suite logo. So maybe it had a subliminal, you know, effect, but really what we're doing with retargeting ads, as well as that monthly update, as well as any PR you can get during your fundraise is you're just staying top of mind with these investors, right? These investors, again, they're getting 50 introductions a day. They're meeting with 30 companies a week. So even if you crushed it, you had a great pitch meeting, you know, a week later, they've already met with 29 other companies. So you, what we're doing here is staying top of mind with these investors. We're worming our, <laughs> sounds malicious, but we're worming our way into their mind. Um, using, you know, an online slide deck, this is somewhat controversial. Some investors complain about 
having to like uh, look at an online deck. They want a PDF attached. I really like sending the online version. For one, I can track who's actually seen it. For number two is I can control it, right? And I can also update it. So even if I sent an investor a link to my deck three weeks ago, I've, I've made three weeks worth of improvements to that deck. So if he comes back three weeks later, it's always the latest and greatest version. Um, Facebook could be another way to map your connections to investors. Um, should be pretty intuitive. And then, you know, while you're out there doing this, take a look at Angelus syndicates. If you already have at least half of your round committed, it can be a way to fill out the round. Um, it's sometimes worth it to explore applying at angel groups. Um, you know, the advantages you can get in front of 50 investors at once. The disadvantages, you usually have to apply, go through screening committee, all that stuff, and it can take a couple months. And then lastly, you might explore equity crowdfunding, especially if you have a product that has like a built-in fan base already that you might want to raise money from your fans or some, you know, really clever like consumer product. Okay, um, I'm not going to, I'll send you guys this deck so you can kind of read this at your own leisure, but if you don't have a lead investor, what do you do? One hack is to collect conditional commitments from everyone as you're going along and until the round is actually oversubscribed. So if you're raising like a million dollars, you just collect conditional commitments from everyone until you have maybe 1.2 conditionally committed. And then you go back to everyone and say, hey, this this thing actually went faster than expected. We're actually oversubscribed now. Um, are you still interested in coming in? And here's the terms. And those conditions often will disappear. It's tapping that kind of fear of missing out, especially when something is oversubscribed. All right, almost done. So you've been fundraising for two months. Hopefully you're getting momentum going. Um, now it's time to try and actually close your round so you can get back to your business. So a couple tips and hacks here. Every time you have a pitch meeting, don't walk out of that pitch meeting or Zoom or Skype call until you've actually asked them their interest level. And so it goes like this. Hey, great meeting you. Thanks for the time today. Um, I'd love to hear your interest level, what your typical check size is, and what your process is like and then just stop talking. And you usually get a generic response like, oh, we'll talk it over at our partner's meeting. But if the response includes a next step, that's a pretty strong buying signal. Um, number two is actually make them pitch you. So again, really appreciate your meeting with me today. I'd love to hear, before I leave, I'd love to hear how you help your portfolio companies. And I'd love to hear how you would help me grow Founder Suite. And then again, kind of shut up and let them talk and make them actually pitch you a little bit. And the reason this works is because every investor has lost out on a competitive deal that was oversubscribed where there are more investors trying to get in than there were seats at the cap table. And so you're signaling that maybe your deal is not automatic, that they might have to work to get into your deal. And as you get momentum going, you know, this really creates like this feeding frenzy with investors. It's very powerful. Um, it takes at least a few meetings before you get a term sheet. And of course, once you get a term sheet, you can take that around to everyone and say, hey, I've got a term sheet. Are you interested in coming in? Uh, you can kind of use it as a catalyst, either to get other term sheets or to get people to commit. You're going to get ghosted a lot. Number four here, um, we call it VC ghosting. You'll have a great meeting. You think you killed it. And then you never hear from that investor again and they don't respond to your emails. Uh, my rule of thumb is two to three. Here, I'll show you my board. I actually have a column for this, which is kind of funny. I have my said no column, and then I have a no response column. And my rule of thumb is I'll send an investor two to three emails, and if they still haven't responded to like the second or third email, I move them over here uh, and just, you know, let them be. That is a no right? And others will say, I like you, but you're too early. That's also a no. So I move them to this column called revisit for series A. VC ghosting is just another way investors say no, don't take it personally. 
when someone does say yes, we want to do Paul Graham's handshake deal protocol. Uh, as an example, you're out for coffee. They say, I like it. Put me down for 50K. You just go back to your laptop after the meeting saying, great meeting you. Just to confirm you're in for 50K. Do you mind you know, writing back and confirming that? And if they write back saying, yes, I'm in for 50, you, know, you can move them into the committed column. If they don't, they're still just a prospect and should be treated as such. Last but not least, again, maybe one of the most important things in this whole talk is if you're going to raise money, don't stop until those, the wires actually cross into your bank account. I've seen this story. I've been fundraising for 14 years, seen this story play out over and over again where founders are out there raising money. They're out there two or three months. They're getting tired of the rejection. Their customers are yelling at them. Their co-founders are tired of hearing about them complain all the time. And they kind of take their foot off the gas pedal on the fundraising. An investor drops out, term sheet's delayed, and the whole thing kind of collapses and the company sometimes runs out of money. So if you're going to do this, just get it all the way over the finish line. Um, our money shot here. Last but not least, uh, keep this all in context. This is just the starting point, not the finish line. You've raised a million dollars. Congratulations. I'd love to hear about it, especially if you're using Founder Suite. That really means you've got, you know, 12 months of runway. That really means you need to start fundraising again six to nine months from now at a higher level of metrics and expectations. So get out there and perform. Um, very last but not least, uh, we have this Facebook group they should check out. It's uh, uh, Funding Hacks, it's pretty low activity, about one post a week. And then we have this podcast. This is the thing I really want to plug. Um, I've been interviewing about 73 founders since the beginning of this year on how they raise money. And I've learned more in 10 months of doing this podcast than in 10 years of fundraising. And the, the short answer is like, there's every way people have raised money. Lots of really good tips in here. Any questions? Are you guys more motivated or less motivated to go fundraise after hearing this talk? Sometimes I think this talk actually scares people away. <laughs> hey, Tal. Um, so does our product help generating leads to investors? So our database, you might've missed it, but we have got about 21,000 venture funds and 100,000 angels, family offices, fund of funds. So yeah, it's, it's helpful for building that target list. Yeah, you'll, you'll see in the recording, maybe you missed the start of this, but you know, in building that list of leads to investors, there's really, I don't want to say there's no single database you need to use, but um, if you use Founder Suite, AngelList, Crunchbase, and then some of those newsletters, you'll cover pretty much the universe of investors. Uh, Tao, so you go out to find the investors based on this tool. So again, step number one is building your target list of investors, and you do that by looking uh, for investors on Founder Suite, Crunchbase, AngelList, and some of those newsletters. You bet. Uh, Edward, what is a geographic breakdown of the email database? I don't have that exactly. I know we've got about 6,000 investors like in New York. We've got about 5,000 in London, a um, couple, maybe 4,000 in Paris. Um, it's, if I had to ballpark that, it's probably 60% US, 40% uh, rest of world, very strong in like centers like you'd expect, like London. Sydney, you know, places like that. Um, but we've got, got a pretty good representation even in Asia. Not, I, I almost answered that question, Edward, in where do we not have groups of investors? Really don't have much in China or Japan. Um, yeah, that's about it. Good stuff. Any other questions? Um, I know it's Friday and probably ready for the weekend. Well, if anyone has any other questions, you're welcome to email me, Nathan at foundersuite.com. Hope you check it out. Check out the podcast. You'll learn a lot of stuff we didn't cover here and uh, pretty, some pretty inspirational stories in the podcast as well. 
All right. I will end it here. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everyone. Cheers.